very warm welcome to Holy Trinity. I'm going to invite you just to have a conversation amongst yourselves for a few moments longer because the live stream hasn't kicked in. So we're just going to try and sort that out and then I'll come back and uh, I'll give the notices. Folks, apologies for that. Uh, apologies for those of you on the live stream. Uh, we're still having a few technical difficulties, but we will upload it later on today. I'm sorry if it doesn't go out live this morning, but it will be there this afternoon. Uh, a very warm welcome. My name's Martin. I'm Vicar here, and I'll be leading the service this morning. As we start, there are a number of notices uh, just to go through. Uh, quite a few dates just to remind you of things which are coming up. Uh, first of all, this afternoon, between three and five, we've got a cream tea at Kravitz Farm at Rosemary Townsend's. Rosemary, uh, I think I've seen Rosemary this morning. Many thanks for organising this, uh, and we look forward to... No cream. <laughs> Lots of cakes, as I say, cream will go off very quickly. But uh, if you're able to join us, we'd love to see you there. If you don't know where Gravitz Farm is, have a word with me after the service. I'll try and explain or I'll email you a map. Uh, there's another one on the 28th of August at Gay Buckley's at Crouchers, the, the yellow house on the corner. Same time again, three till five, I think. Is that right, Gay? Uh, and you'd be very welcome to join us then. Uh, this Tuesday at 1 o'clock, Samuel and Emily getting married. You'd be very welcome to join us for that service. We'd love to see you if you're able to. And then on Thursday at 12.30 uh, is Alan Miles' funeral, followed by a burial. Uh, Rosie's uh, asked me if I would share a number of things with you this morning. First of all, just say thank you for all your kindness and prayers at this sad time. Uh, there are going to be flowers from the family, but they're inviting donations uh, from those who attend to the British Lung Foundation There'll be a box at the back at the service, but you could also put them through her letterbox, she says. Uh, and you'd be very welcome to join her and the family at the Fox afterwards for refreshments. She asked if you could let her know just so they know how many to cater for at the Fox. Uh, and she's asked if people would do that by texting her her numbers in the church directory. But if you haven't got it, have a word with me and I can let you have her mobile phone number. The other thing is she would love people to wear yellow. It was uh, Alan's favourite colour. So if you've got a yellow accessory or a yellow item of clothing, uh, she'd love it if you could wear that. Uh, next Sunday, the 21st of August at 6 o'clock, we've got a service of Compline. You'd be very welcome to join us. And then on the 4th of Sunday, we've got a Songs of Praise service at 6 o'clock in the evening. Various people will be sharing uh, stories and testimonies about the hymns they've chosen. And then that Wednesday, the 7th, we've got the church prayer meeting for the term. Uh, I've been mentioning in the last few weeks about the church away day. There's now a sign-up sheet if you'd like to join us on the away day, either for the teaching morning, uh, the harvest lunch, or the walk, or all three or two of those. You can sign up on this sheet, and it'll be on the font after the service. The other thing is a slightly longer notice. Just uh, Some of you may have come across uh, independent monitoring boards. Some of you may never have heard of them. Uh, there is each prison in this country has an independent monitoring, mo monitoring board uh, and they stand between the prisoners and the prison authorities to make sure things are happening uh, and to sort out any problems to ensure that prisoners are looked after with fairness and decency. Many of you know Charlie Finney, a member of our congregation here, and he chairs that board at Ford Open Prison. And, and all of the independent monitoring boards across the country are in a process of recruitment until the 11th of September. Uh, it's a voluntary uh, position, but if you would be interested in doing that, then have a word with me. Uh, Charlie is away for a couple of weeks, but he's given me the name and number of another member of the board who would be very happy to have an informal conversation with you if you want to find out more. 
The only way to apply is through the, the government website, the Independent Monitoring Board website. Uh, but I do commend it to you as Christians. Uh, we're here. We can't set the prisoners free. Obviously, that's the government's job and the parole board's job. But we can care for them and make sure they're treated with decency and respect. So if you'd like to know more about that, uh, do have a word with me, and I can put you in touch with somebody. Now, shall we stand? And let's just commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Let's just shut our eyes. Maybe you've had a good week. Maybe you have had a difficult week. Perhaps you've had times of trouble and you've been crying out to the Lord. Whatever your week has been like, Lord, we come to you this morning to worship you. Lord, we just want to lay those things which have been on our hearts this week good and bad and, and middling. We lift them to you. We lay them at the foot of the cross and give them to you. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to lift our eyes to worship you this morning, to glimpse a fresh vision of you and your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
hope is in you alone. Lord, the one we turn to in times of trouble, the one who rescued us from our sins. And Lord, we praise you and thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your grace, your faithfulness. Lord, we thank you that you are unchanging the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that we can always depend on you. Lord, we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, do please be seated. 
Uh, as many of you will know, we're doing a sermon series uh, over the holidays, looking at homilies from the hassocks. Uh, a little later on, Trish is going to be speaking to us about one of the hassocks, but I've got a different hassock here this morning. Uh, this one says on the side, Jean Francis Boxall. Some of you will know the Miss Boxalls ran the uh, maternity home in the village, and uh, Jill and Roy are going to come and speak to us a little bit about uh, why this Neela is very significant in their family. So Roy and Jill, come on up. We've got a picture of it up on the screen as well. There we go, Jill. Come and tell us about this, Neela. Jill, roll it for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be great. This is not our testimony, but is the testimony of my niece Lila and her husband, on which we had a hand on a part. I have four sisters. We want to tell you why we are interested in this particular Neela. It was a God moment in morning service. We were sitting where Sharon and um, Samuel. Samuel are, and Neela was in front. Here's the story. We have a niece called Lila, and Lila herself has a tragic story. She was born in Jamaica, where my sister met her father, who managed hotels. They had two girls, the youngest being Lila. To all intents and purposes, they seemed a very happy family. They were churchgoers and very much part of the community in Montego Bay. When Lila was five or six, they came back home to England on holiday to see our recently widowed mother, my mother, on holiday. But the father didn't come. But my only sister um, went to England on holiday. My sister and the two girls, Taya and Lila, six years old, came over with their mother. On the 31st of July, 1987, Taya and her cousin, Thomas, were on a bicycle together in my sister's home in Oxfordshire. A neighbour knocked at their door and said there'd been an accident. They rushed out and realised that both cousins, Thomas and Taya, had been knocked off their bike and killed by a reversing lorry in a country lane. Our family were devastated. The effects were enormous within my two sisters' family and Lila as a little girl. Back in Jamaica, Taya's father could not come to terms with what had happened and accused my broken-hearted sister of negligence. The relationship descended into abuse. Lila, confused and insecure, saw all this happening to her mummy. As her mother said, Lila took part in what was almost a role reversal. Through this time, my sister Elizabeth was comforted by her six-year-old daughter. Eventually, my sister separated from her husband and came to England, and having established herself at as a teacher, she was able to attain a place for Lila at Christ Hospital. There she went through the happiest time of her life. She went on to Durham University and at last felt secure. At Durham, she met her future husband. He became an army officer. He was with three para. The next three years, he spent a long time in Afghanistan in Helmand province. Just a fortnight after Sam returned, he left the army and married Lila. All seemed well, but there were traumatic and troubling elements in both their lives. They attended church at Battersea Rise, did the Alpha course, and ran a home group. The relationship with their Lord was revived. After some years, they tried for a baby, 
As sometimes happens, they gradually became aware that this was not going to happen. Not surprising, they became distraught. They tried every means available, but nothing worked. And of course, all the large extended family were praying for them, especially her mother, who regularly, with all, including ourselves and my mother, Granny, went to Crowhurst Healing Center for Holy Communion every week, which is near where they lived in Bexhill. Now we come to the healing story. That's you, Roy. All right. <laughs> well, done. Well, done. well, I'm not going to say anything, really. What I'm going to do is uh, read you what Lila herself has said about this period of her life. And uh, she gave this talk in her church, uh, uh, where she's part of the leadership team, and uh, she, uh, her vicar asked her to give it to the congregation, which she did just a fortnight ago. So this is the last paragraph, so we're cutting out such a great deal. But, uh, you know, I'll tell you what she said. Uh, but first of all, what we did, one day we were up here walking in the grounds, and, uh, no, it was, it was the... Uh, Sitting here, yes, and uh, so uh, and I think Martin asked us, uh, if, you know, a few moments if you wanted to pray about something. So uh, we did. We sat there and we prayed, and then my wife, as she does on these occasions, said to me, "What did you pray about?" <laughs> <And> <laughs> so uh, I said, "I prayed for Lila," and she and Jill said to me, "So did I." So anyway. We then stood up and we leant over and in front of us was this. And you know you have these God moments? That was one. We really were almost speechless. And I said to Jill, I said, Jill, I think that's an answer to prayer. I was afraid that it might be. You were afraid of not being. <laughs> so she said, we, we, said, we said, well, we won't say anything, and, uh, but uh, let's see what happens. And of course, a few weeks later, we were told that Lila was pregnant. Wow. So uh, it was wonderful. However, that's not the end of the story. I want you to listen to Lila talk, my dear niece, whom we love so much. With the arrival of our child, I wish I could say this was our time to breathe. But I suffered, I suppose, unsurprisingly, from postnatal depression. Sam himself was not in a good place, having come back from consecutive tours in Afghanistan with the parachute regiment in Helmand province, where the fiercest of the fighting was actually taking place. He himself had to come to terms with his demons. Every soldier, when he comes back from conflict, has to come to terms with what he's seen and what he's done. Sam was going through that. Anyway, back to Lila. Becoming a mother had begun to unlock some of that awful pain and trauma from my childhood at a time when we were exhausted and tired with a new child. We soldiered on and continued with church but neither of us was sitting pretty. I have to say that having struggled to have children and all that gone before, throughout this time, I make no bones about it, I was furious. I was furious at God, furious that this had happened to me, furious that it couldn't have been easier. Let me tell you, I didn't bear this pain with fortitude or perseverance or prayer. I was simply furious, and believe you me, I let him know. But it was then, extraordinarily, when I look back on it, that I began dealing with the traumas that had imprisoned my soul. I hadn't realized 
that every awful thing I saw, my mother being beaten up, things deadly happening, I had locked away in a great big chest with a lock on it to keep it in place. That lock was now broken. My soul was beginning to ask for release. We soldiered on, as I've said. Understanding myself better, I have to say, is a work in progress. But I find my help now through counseling, and most importantly, God. God comes and meets me wherever I am. It's happened time after time. But I remember looking up in my church in the middle of all this and reading one of the embroidered banners at the front. And this was like God talking directly to me himself. I could hear him speak. He said, my beloved child, you call to me. Arise, my darling. Come away with me. My beautiful one. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers have appeared in the countryside, the season of singing has come. I burst into tears, right there, tears of thankfulness and gratefulness, because I believed it. It was my experience. Looking back, through all of this, it's been a long time, but there has been one steady constant, and that is God's loving faithfulness. He never let me down. Life, of course, will always be a dual road of blessings and trials, but having been through what I have, God finding me when I couldn't find myself, and knowing he loves me, and loving me just the beautiful, broken way I am is a testament to God's love and triumph. Not my own, it's his. I will always do my best to stay close as I can to God. But the breathtaking reality is that it is God who stays close to me. That is why I am a Christian. Well, Angel, thank you ever so much. Let, let you go and sit back down. Uh, we're going to turn to prayer now. It may be that there's an ELA around you which speaks to you. Uh, it may just be that you've come with something on your heart, a bit like Roy and Jill had that morning. And so we're going to start our prayers this morning just by giving you a time, uh, just in the quietness of your own hearts, to bring your deepest need or the deepest need of your friends or your family before the Lord. So let's bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we lift these needs before you. We thank you for the way uh, you answered Roy and Jill's prayers in Lida's life. We thank you for the way you're continuing to work in her. And Lord, we pray for these things we've lifted before you this morning. We cry out to you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to uh, use some other needles for our prayers now. This is a, a needle which we'll be looking at a bit later on in our service. It's a needle of two <coughs> angels, uh, and angels are God's messengers. And so I thought it would be good to pray for us as we are God's messengers, taking the good news of Jesus Christ into the heart of our community. So let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege of partnering with you to, to tell others about Jesus. Lord, we ask you'd help us to take Jesus Christ into the heart of our community, to be good news to our friends, our neighbours and our family. Lord, we pray for courage 
and for your spirit to be with us when we're given opportunities to explain the hope we have in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we've got a, a picture of another kneeler. This is a, a kneeler which there's two of these and you won't see them on the pews because we only get these kneelers out for weddings. So you can see on the side there is embroidered in there with this th ring, I the wed. And these kneelers will be coming out this week for a wedding. So let's pray for the couple getting married this week. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father, we thank you for Samuel and Emily. We pray your blessing upon them as they get married on Tuesday. Lord, we pray that they would know your presence with them in a very real and tangible way, not just on Tuesday, but throughout their married lives together. Bless them, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the next kneeler, I don't know uh, where this is. You might have it next to you. This is uh, a Christmas kneeler, really. It's three kings. Uh, but uh, they were really wise men in the account of the nativity. Uh, but it's the closest I could find. Ah, oh, there we go. Bruce has got it. Wonderful. It's the closest I could find to those in positions of power. So we're going to use this to pray for earthly kings and those in positions of power. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father, we want to start by thanking you for our parish council here in Rudrick, for those who serve us in this way. We pray for wisdom and for guidance for the decisions they make. Lord, we pray uh, for those involved in governance in a wider sense. Lord, we think of those in our congregation who are school governors, those who are uh, trustees of charities. We pray also for our MP, Jeremy Quinn, and his work, not just in the constituency, but in the Ministry of Defence. And Lord, we pray for uh, the new Prime Minister, whoever it is who is elected in September. We pray for wisdom and for guidance for them. Lord, we pray for those in charge of water companies and the Climate and the Environment Agency at this time. We pray for guidance and wisdom. And Lord, we pray for those who can make big changes in the way we treat envi the environment, for those who can legislate, for those in positions of influence. Lord, we pray that they would act wisely and for the common good. We pray for uh, the elections in Kenya this week and for those awaiting the result. We pray for whoever is elected as president that they would govern for the common good. And Lord, we pray for the situation in Ukraine and for an end to the violence and the fighting. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our final kneeler this morning is this one, uh, which is the one we looked at last week, the Holy Spirit. And it's a reminder that as well as doctors and nurses healing people, the Lord can heal people through his spirit. So let's pray uh, for those who need to know the Lord's touch. And in a moment of quiet, you might want to just lift before the Lord, those known to you. Father, we pray for all of those who are suffering at this time, whether physically, mentally, or spiritually. We think particularly of Rosie, Chris, and Nikki Miles, and St. Maud Allen's death. Lord, we pray that they would know your peace and your comfort at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to turn to song now. We're going to sing a, a song all about uh, Jesus being the light of the world. It's called My Lighthouse. If you would like to stand, and we'll sing.
So would you like to sit as Chris brings us to our reading? Good morning. The Psalms are traditionally associated with King David, but actually, actually they reflect centuries of individual and corporate responses to God. Themes include the law, Jerusalem and the temple, Israel's history, the natural world, human suffering and God's justice. Psalm 91, which you'll find on page 600 in your pew Bibles. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the most high your dwelling, even the Lord, who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command the angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me, says the Lord, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Hear me all right. Let's find somewhere to stick this. <laughs> Ian, can you? <laughs> Sorry about this. It's what husbands are for. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Abigail, can we have the picture of the angel Neela back? <laughs> the angel one. The angel one. Brilliant, thank you. Right, would somebody under 10 like to find it for us? It is in the church somewhere, and I'll give you a clue. When I last saw it, it was in the middle. Anybody? I think it might have got covered up. Oh, Rita, I didn't know you were so young. <laughs> thank you. I think most of us in here would recognize that as angels, would we not? I mean, they are usually portrayed as graceful human figures, um, gorgeous, elegant, massive, feathered wings, and they're often in that sort of pose, aren't they? Um, hands clasped in prayer, they might be playing a musical instrument, they might be singing. We'd all recognize it, but... Is that really what they look like? Do you really think that's what they are like? And would we recognize one if we saw one? Have we met one? I thought we'd start this morning's talk by finding out what we do know about angels, or maybe what we think we know, 
and then compare it with what the Bible says. So first off, we have our angels here, definitely looking fairly human. What does the Bible say? Do they have physical bodies? Hands up if you think angels have got physical bodies. Oh, I've got two up in the gallery, two from one person. <laughs> Unless Abigail's trying to get my attention. Did I get any more? I did get some votes for physical bodies. Well, actually, if you have a look at the first chapter of Hebrews, it tells us that they are ministering spirits. And they're sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. So do you think if they maybe don't have physical bodies, they need to eat or drink? Anybody think they need to? OK, hands up if you think they can. Ah, yes. Because sometimes they come and help us in human form, don't they? They come with messages from God or something like that. So they're spirits. They probably don't need to, but they can if necessary. And then, of course, the big question, according to the Neela, have they got wings? <laughs> Hands up if you think angels have these gorgeous, great big feathery wings. Oh, no take. Oh, Chris thinks they've got wings. And Brenda thinks they probably have. Well, do you know what the Bible says? It says that only the, well, it doesn't say only, but the only ones you will find as recorded as having wings are cherubim and cherubim. And nowhere does it say they're great big feathery things like birds have. And if you think about it, if anybody recognizes Isaiah's vision, um, where he saw the cherubim, they had six wings, didn't they? And two of them they used to cover their faces, and two to cover their feet, and two to fly. And if they were as big as those, they'd probably get in the way. <laughs> so that's the wings thing. Um, are they male or female? Hands up for male. Nobody thinks they're male. Hands up for feet. Oh, Christine does. Hands up for female. Oh, you do both, she says. Anybody think they don't have a gender? Ah, I think you're ahead of me. I don't think I need to give this talk. <laughs> and the clue actually comes from what Jesus says. Um, and I think it's in Matthew 18, if I've got the right reference. Um, somebody will no doubt. Uh, no, I think Matthew 18 is another one, actually. But anyway, Jesus does say it's where the Sadducees are trying to trip him up as usual. And they come up with this scenario for him where there are seven brothers. And the oldest brother is married, and then they all die off in turn. And because of the tradition at the day, the younger brother, the next one down, marries the widow, and so on. And the Sadducees say to Jesus, well, OK, who is she married to when she gets up to heaven? And Jesus says, he says, I will find it, um, just like the angels who neither marry nor are given in marriage, no marriage in heaven. And from that, we can intimate that they probably don't have a gender and they don't need to reproduce. So, so far, we have established they are ministering spirits. They don't need to eat and drink, but they can if they assume human form. Some of them have wings, but probably not these gorgeous, feathery, elegant things. Um, probably no specific gender. Now, here's an interesting one. Have we got a guardian angel? Who thinks we've got a guardian angel? Yeah, quite a lot of people. Martin thinks so. That's an endorsement. <laughs> That's, an en <laughs> That's an endorsement. This is where we get Matthew 18, which is what I come, came up with earlier. Jesus is talking about little children. And he says, see that you do not look down on these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. And he's intimating that each of these little children has a guardian angel, which I think is a lovely thought. And I don't know about you, but I don't think our need for a guardian angel falls off as we get older. I think I need one even more, probably. <laughs> Do people become angels when they die? No, quite right, they don't. Are there a lot of them? 
Yes, there are, aren't there? There's vast numbers. And God is a God of order, so they're organized. Anybody like to tell me what the top rank of angels is? Perhaps one of the children? Anybody? Volunteer top rank of an angel? Archangel, absolutely. How many archangels are there? Jill says one. Any advance on one? Two? Three? Where, where are we settling? Two. Okay. Who'd like to name them? Sorry? Louder, somebody? Michael and Gabriel. Michael is definitely an archangel. He is referred to as the archangel Michael. But Gabriel is not referred to as an archangel in the Bible. He is only ever referred to as the angel Gabriel. But there is probably another one, and I don't know if it's what Jill is saying. Can anybody think of who else might be, and probably was, an archangel, with the emphasis on was? Yeah, Lucifer, before he fell out of grace, before he got too big for his boots. Scholars think that he was probably head honcho of the archangels. So a last question on quick thumbnail sketch of angels. What about ratio of angels to demons? Anyone want to venture a thought on that one? No? More than one to one. That's a very warm answer, a very hot answer. <laughs> What? Two to one. Well done, Abigail. Absolutely. <laughs> Can you tell me why? Because a third fell away. Absolutely. <laughs> Abigail's got it. <laughs> because we're told in Revelation, aren't we, that the, the, um, the great dragon, I will find the reference, um, he lashed his tail as he was kicked out of heaven and knocked a third of the stars out of heaven, and they fell to earth. And angels are often referred to as stars in the Bible. So we've got our thumbnail sketch of angels. But perhaps the most important question for us is, are they still around? Are they here to help us now? And what I'd like to do is read you a couple of stories, because I think they most definitely are. These two books are pictured. I don't know if you can get them up on the screen, Abigail, can you? <coughs> yeah, there we are. Um, these two books are in the church email. This one is Billy Graham, Angels, God's Secret Agents. And it is absolutely jam-packed with biblical references about angels. It's a fascinating book. And this one is called The Night the Angels Came by somebody called Chrissy Chapman. For some reason, the wrong author's given in the email, but if you zoom in on the picture of the book, you'll see. It is inspirational. And that's the first story I'm going to read you. Chrissy went out to Burundi in, um, I think, when did she go out? She went out in 1990 to open a maternity clinic for the local people out there. And very soon after she got there, civil war bubbled up, and it was brutal, a really violent civil war. And her little clinic was up the mountain. It got so bad that she sent all her staff down the mountain, but she stayed there with one person, um, a colleague called David, both of them deeply committed Christians. And I will read you just a little excerpt from that book I've just held up. She says, one evening, David and I were sitting on the front doorstep of my small mud house. Gunfire sounded all around us, and we could hear crying and terrified screaming coming from the hills. You could feel and almost touch the terror in those screams. And as we sat praying and crying out to God for his help, peace and protection, David suddenly stood up and began to praise God. And he was saying over and over, 
thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. And he said to me, Chrissy, just look on the walls. And I couldn't see anything, and I didn't know what he was talking about. And so David put his hands on my eyes and prayed that God would open my eyes to see what he was seeing. And as I opened my eyes, I saw dozens of huge angels standing shoulder to shoulder on top of the six foot high wall that surrounded the perimeter of our healing center. These strong, shining, heavenly beings clothed in full armor with gleaming breastplates were standing on top of the wall in a complete circle with their backs to us, <coughs> looking outward. They looked so huge and strong that I was filled with so much awe that every bit of fear drained out of my body and could no longer touch me. Now that is a book that Chrissy wrote six years ago. So that is bang up to date. And, in, and that's an instance of where God sometimes permits us to see the help that he has sent. And I've got another story for you where sometimes we find out later um, that God has sent his angels. And that's from this one, from Billy Graham's book. And to save time, I won't actually read it to you, but it is in there. Um, a missionary called the Reverend John Payton. He was a Victorian, and he went out to the New Hebrides Islands in the South Pacific as a missionary to cannibals. Now, I don't know if there are any children here who'd like to tell me what cannibals do. Anybody tell me? Christine, what do cannibals do? Do you know? No? They eat people. <laughs> Not very pleasant. <laughs> anyway, they did not take kindly to Christian missionary coming out. And they were out to get him, basically. And one night, they came, and they surrounded the little house where John Payton and his wife were staying. And they wanted to set fire to it. They clearly wanted to eat John Payton and his wife. And just like Pretty and David did, John and his wife cried out for protection to the Lord. Then they prayed all night. And when morning came, they couldn't believe it. The natives had gone. A year later, the chief became a Christian. And John Payton said to him, by the way, why didn't you carry on attacking us that night? And the chief said, well, you had all those big men with you. And John said, no, no, it's just me and my wife. And the chief was insistent. He said there were huge, great big men with spears, uh, and they just had to conclude that they'd been angels. And sometimes I think that's what happens. God sends his protection. Those he is protecting don't necessarily see it. They just know that there's prote protection. But those who want to do harm do see something. I'll tell you one last story very quickly from our own lives, from Ian and me. Um, and this is a very, I can't prove these were angels, but Ian and I have no other explanation for this. And this is a time where sometimes I think God just sends his help. Um, and it appears in human form. It's a bit like the three men, it wasn't help necessarily, it was messengers, the three men who came to Abraham. They looked like men, but they were angels. And in our case, um, Ian is a bit of a yachty, He's rather good at sailing, and unfortunately for him, his wife isn't. Um, but we were on a um, shore-based sailing holiday. Ian was allowed to take a yacht out for the day with me and two other non-sailors as crew, and off we went. And it was gorgeous. It was blue sky, blue sea, blue everything. You could hardly see the horizon. It was just beautiful. It all merged and melded. Not a boat or a person or anything anywhere in sight. We had a packed lunch, and we thought it'd be nice to try and find somewhere, a beach to have it. Saw a little island, and we thought that'd be great. Um, so we went over to the island, and Ian said, I'm a bit worried about the depth sounder, you know, the thing that tells you how near the bottom you are. Posted the other chap on the bows to keep a lookout, but unfortunately, there was a shuddering jolt, and the keel of the yacht had jammed between two rocks like that. We were stuck not a boat or anybody in sight. Ian knew what to do. He got a rope on the top of the mast, and we tried to rock the boat. And 20 minutes later, nothing had happened. We were stuck. Ian and I were praying like mad privately. 
wondering what on earth to do, what Ian knew that the rest of us didn't, is that if you get stuck or in trouble at sea and something comes and rescues you, there's a thing called salvage. And whoever comes and rescues you then owns your boat, which could be slightly <laughs> embarrassing. Anyway, suddenly, out of the complete blue, appears a little motorboat. It comes straight over towards us. There are two chaps in the boat. We were in Turkey, two Turkish chaps, spoke perfect English, came up to us. Are you in trouble? Yes, we are. Can you help? Turned out they were divers. They knew exactly what to do. One of them dived down, had a look at the keel. They got a rope on the mast. They attached it to the motorboat. Ten minutes, we were off. They disappeared. Now, what are the chances in a situation like that of exactly the help you need? Two local chaps speak perfect English. Divers know what to do. Deal with it. Disappear. We've always thought that must have been God's provision. It's just extraordinary, I think. So there we are. That's a, a thumbnail sketch of angels, who they are, what they are, what they're sent to do. There are about 300 references to angels in the Bible, Old and New Testament. And I've given you some stories of the fact that they, they're not confined to biblical times. And I asked Martin if we could have Psalm 91 this morning, especially because of that verse, um, verse 11, which says, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. And the last two verses of the Psalm, 14 and 15, give us a clue about for whom that provision is available. Those verses say, I will rescue him, I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. And we've had stories, haven't we, of modern people in trouble, crying out to the Lord, including Ian and me, I think angels are around. There are so many stories. Maybe you're aware you've received angelic help. Maybe the talk I've given this morning has just shed a bit of light on an occasion when help came from somewhere and you don't know where. And maybe it was an angel. And I think the thought I'd like to leave you with is just the sheer generosity of God's provision of helping us through angels. And next time we're in trouble, let's cry out to God. Let's ask him for his help. And if someone comes, just like those two divers came to us, thank God, because they just might be an angel. Patricia, thank you. As the band come back, we're going to sing again. We've been thinking about God's provision with angels. We're going to think about his ultimate provision for our sins as we come to the Lord's table uh, and the way he has dealt with our sins. So would you please stand to sing Holy Overshadowing. Thank you. 
So would you please sit or kneel to pray? Remind us, we come to the Lord's table, uh, there'll be people in the room at the back. If you would like to pray with people after you've received a blessing or communion, you'd be very welcome to. As people were praying before the service, there was the words of Jesus, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And also the belief there's somebody here who might have a problem with their sinus or their ear and the Lord wants to heal you. Also a dove returning to a tree with the words, come rest in my shade and the words speak only in love. If any of those speak to you, can I encourage you to come and pray with people after you've received communion. The Lord is here. So lift up your hearts. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is always right to give you thanks, God, our Creator, loving and faithful, holy and strong. You made us and your whole universe and filled your world with life. You sent your Son to live among us, Jesus our Saviour, Mary's child. He suffered on the cross. He died to save us from our sins. He rose in glory from the dead. You sent your spirits to bring new life to the world and clothe us with power from on high. And so we join with the angels to celebrate and say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Father, on the night before he died, Jesus shared a meal with his friends. He took the bread and thanked you. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. After the meal, Jesus took the cup of wine. He thanked you and gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood, the new promise of God's unfailing love. Do this to remember me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Father, as we bring this bread and wine and remember his death and resurrection, send your Holy Spirit that we who share these gifts may feed on Christ's body and his blood. Pour your Spirit on us that we may love one another, work for the healing of the earth and share the good news of Jesus as we wait for his coming in glory. For honour and praise belong to you, Father, with Jesus, your Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. And so, as our Saviour has taught us, we say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread.
So the words, uh, we join in with the words on the screen together. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life we who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. 
Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, having just eaten and drunk at the Lord's table, we're going to praise his name in our final song, Anastasius. Would you please stand to sing? peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain upon you this day and always. Amen. Amen.